claim to that old Ricky Cross story, and that's our hope. And just to just to know when the enemy tries to get you to think that you are under his feet, that what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, that he has no power, he has no authority over us. Isn't that something to get so excited about? I just, oh, I just love the cross of Christ, thankful for the cross. And the good news of Jesus, what he did for us on the cross is absolutely the best news ever told. So I just want to read, Rick just did... Um, 18 through 21, and I'm going to pick it up at 22 through 25. So I just want to read that part again real quick. And it says, For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So point number one is the power of of God's wisdom. So why did the Jews, the religious people, and the Greeks, the intellectuals, consider the Christian message so foolish? And for the Jews, in verse 22, they requested a sign. And in the Jews, the Jewish world, they were looking for a sign. They were looking for, um, specifically, a miraculous messianic deliverance. And they weren't looking for the message of the cross and their desire for deliverance wasn't bad, but their rejection of God's way of delivering them was. And their idolatry was that they now had God all figured out and that he was just going to simply repeat the exodus in simply this much greater splendor. And that's how they figured that God was going to do it. They had them all figured out. And in Jesus, they saw one who was meek and lowly and who deliberately avoided anything spectacular, the spotlight, and then the poor guy who wound up on a cross. That is how they saw they saw Jesus, their, their deliverer, this, this chosen one. And so, you know, he, he served and, and, and he wanted to stay in the background. And it seemed to them this impossible picture of the chosen one of God because they were looking for this powerful warrior king who was full of splendor, who would lead them to victory, that is who they thought of when they thought of the chosen one of God. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. And the Greek culture, they value the pursuit of wisdom, usually expressed in high academic philosophical terms. And they did not value the wisdom expressed in the message of the cross. Their wisdom was not bad, but their rejection of God's wisdom was and the Greeks regarded Christ as such absolute foolishness. They just couldn't wrap their brain around this Christ crucified. But God did not respond to their opinions or their polling data on this matter. He kept to his gospel because he knew for those who believed, the Jews and the Greeks, and there were many Jews and there were many Greeks who did believe in this Christ crucified. Christ crucified was and is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And if the cross and his message seem weak, let me reassure you, it is not. It is powerful and it is wise. But our expectations of what God should do keep us from receiving that power and that wisdom. The foolishness of God is, let me tell you, much wiser than men. And God was at his most foolish and his very weakest at the cross. But it was infinitely wiser than anything that man could do. Man would not have went to the cross just on his own to die for, for other human beings. He would not have, we would have not been able to, to do that on the cross for the world. It wouldn't have been something that we could have done. It took God to do this. And to any thinking Greek, the incarnation was an absolute, total impossibility. And it was incredible that one who had suffered as Christ had suffered could possibly be the Son of God. It just seemed like a total, absolute impossibility. The Greeks, they were intoxicated with their fine words. And to them, a Christian preacher with a blunt message seemed crude and uncultured to be laughed at and ridiculed not to be respected. And that's what Paul preached. That's what Paul went through. He was ridiculed and he was laughed at. And verse 23, we preach Christ crucified. 
And as I was putting this message together, when I came to this part in the message, it just reminded me of Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 9. And it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Amen. And there's an old poem, and I just, I love this. It's about the acorn and the pumpkin. I don't know if any of you have ever heard this poem, but it's it just um, really kind of um, goes along with this foolishness and how we think and how God thinks. And so there's an old poem, and it tells the story of a woman who was walking through this meadow. And as she strolled along, she was meditating on nature, and she came upon a field with these golden pumpkins. And in the corner of the field stood this majestic oak tree. And the woman sat down under the oak tree, and she was pretty tired, and she began to muse about the strange twists in nature. These tiny acorns hung on these huge branches, and these huge pumpkins sat on these tiny little vines, and she thought, God blundered with creation. He should have put the small acorns on these tiny little vines, and these, these um, large pumpkins should have been put on these huge branches. It just made a lot of sense to her. And so she was resting beneath the tree. She eventually drifted off to sleep, and she was awakened by this tiny little acorn that bounced off the tip of her nose, and she began to chuckle to herself, and she amended her previous thought, and she thought, just goes to show that God knew best all along. And aren't you so glad that God's ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts, because knowing you and I, we would have put those large pumpkins up in those huge branches, and those tiny little acorns on those tiny little vines, and what a total catastrophe that would have been. Can you imagine the pumpkins falling from the sky? I mean, that's my um, animated mind just is thinking of, you know, pumpkins falling from the sky. But anyway, um, so instead of giving the Jews and the Greeks what they demanded and deliverance and wisdom and all that stuff, God gave them something so unexpected. He gave them this crucified Messiah. And Christ Messiah meant power and splendor and triumph. Everything that they were looking for in their, their Messiah and this chosen one of God, that is what they were looking for. But then crucified meant weakness, defeat, and humiliation. What in the world was God thinking when he put the two together, Christ crucified? What in the world was this? So putting the two together, the Christ crucified, was the absolute ultimate oxymoron, and this is what Paul preached. In the message of the cross, God has reached down and he has dirtied his hands, revealing his inner character of love and mercy and forgiveness. Aren't you so thankful? And in the process, humbling the proud and overturning our opinion, human opinion, about what greatness really truly is. And ironically, God's greatness is displayed by the depths to which he is willing to go to rescue you and to rescue me from sin. So why were the Jews and the Greeks so offended by this Christian message? The Jews regarded Christ crucified as a stumbling block, an offense, or a scandal. Salvation is not the achievement of, hu of human wisdom. It is the embrace of God's dramatic, unexpected act of love at Calvary. That's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should perish would have everlasting life. Amen. The incarnation, the most astonishing event at the center of Christianity, the story that has inspired architect, music, and hope is God's way of doing exactly that. Christ comes in flesh to cover our mortal wound, which is sin. Christ comes near in body and in weakness to bring healing to our weak and wounded bodies, our weak and wounded minds, our spirit, our flesh. He comes to bring healing to those areas. And indeed, God's own body mortally wounded only to rise again in flesh and blood. He rose so that we can be victorious in our lives. And this may seem to some that don't understand such foolishness. It's a foolish mission indeed, I'm sure some people think. But to the blind who receive their sight, the lame who now walk, the diseased who are cleansed, the deaf who hear, 
the dead who are raised, the poor who have good news brought to them, the relationships that have been restored, the prodigal son or the prodigal daughter that has come home, the alcoholic or the drug addict. It is the most beautiful foolishness ever known. And I am so glad, and I think about this often, that I had parents that raised us four children in a, in a home that he that they taught us about the cross and, and we, we learned about Jesus Christ and what he did for us on that cross. And if you've ever heard me talk about my home life, you have heard me talk about dysfunction junction because my home was about as dysfunctional as it can get. And my parents were not perfect. They had imperfect children. We're in an imperfect world. So what do you expect? Except, you know, imperfect families as well. But um, they taught us kids about the cross. And as a child, hearing about these events leading up to the cross and about Jesus being crucified made such an impact, such a lasting impact on my life. And I can tell you that my parents and all their imperfection that they did right by us children, <coughs> by, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> losing my voice. They did right in the, in the eyes of God by raising us children to believe in the cross and to believe in Jesus Christ. And it just always stayed with me. And even though I went down these wrong roads and I was in, <clears throat> in sin, the cross stayed etched in the back of my mind and it stayed with me in my heart. And it was the cross and Christ crucified Amen. that brought me out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And each of us that are here today, we can say that, that it was the cross that we that we um, learned about in children's church and Sunday school, that those that, that is what stayed with us. It stayed in our hearts and it stayed in our minds. But I think sometimes as we get caught up in the hustle and the bustle of our everyday lives, we lose sight of Christ crucified and all that transpired there on that brutal day. But as we begin to turn our focus Back to the cross, today we begin to feel the power of Christ's crucifixion begin to outshine any distractions in our life, especially as we're coming into the holiday seasons, we get distracted. But the but Christ's crucifixion shines out any pride, any distraction in our in our hearts and in our lives. And not only did Christ die this horrible and this brutal death, but he rose again on the third day. And that is how we as believers can be victorious in our lives. And Acts 2.24 says that God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. And we as Christ followers can no longer be held in sin's power. Colossians 2.15 says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, <laughs> triumphing over them by the cross. And if you are a child of God, you are not under Satan's feet. Depression has no hold on you. Alcohol and drugs has no hold on you. Grief now has no hold on you. Nothing has a hold on you. Nothing from the pit of hell has a hold on you if you are a child of God. And if you're here today and you do not know this Jesus that Rick and I have talked about today, I would like to give you the opportunity to receive him into your heart today because none of us are promised tomorrow. And I remember the first time I was I heard this statement, the statistics on death are very impressive because one out of one people die. My husband, Rick Bloom, was the first person I ever heard say that and I thought you know what that's so true because we all have an expiration date don't we we all have an expiration date it could be today it could be tomorrow it could be a week it could be 5 10 15 20 50 years from now but we each have an expiration date on our lives so I would ask that in everyone that's here today if you would close your eyes and just repeat this prayer after me dear Heavenly Father we want to be a part of your family. We repent of our sins. And you said in your word that if I acknowledge that you raised Jesus from the dead and that I accept him as my Lord and Savior, I would be saved. So God, I now say and believe 
you raised Jesus from the dead and that he is alive and well. I accept him now as my personal Lord and Savior. I accept my salvation from sin. Thank you, Father God, for forgiving me, saving me, and giving me eternal life with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer this morning in faith, you're now saved and your sins are washed away and your slate is wiped clean. And if you accepted Christ this morning in your heart, I would like, we would like you to, to come and, and let us talk to you and pray with you this morning. And um, we just, Rick and I are just so happy that, that we were able to come and minister to you this morning. And we're all um, lifting up Pastor Andre and Candy and any, everyone else that's missing from the congregation this morning. We're praying for them this week. So let's not forget to pray for all the people that are out this morning. We love you guys so much. And thank you so much for having